these guys survived the David Kahn era of Timberwolves basketball and live to tell about it. It's Flagrant Howls. A 50 burger for Anthony Edwards last night. A 50 burger, Judd Zolgad, the sports dad here on Flagrant Howls. Very impressive. Wow. And it, it, what a weird game, by the way. The, the, so the Nuggets were playing also last night. So both the Nuggets and the Timberwolves have a back-to-back, and and then the second night is for the one seed tonight, which we'll talk about some of that. Mm-hmm. But it was just kind of it was it was weird vibes. The the Wolves literally were they gave up forty four points in the first quarter to this god awful Wizards team, and they're down by twenty one points. I think was the peak. I'm pretty sure it was twenty one was the the biggest deficit in that game. Mm-hmm. And they just chip away. They start playing some defense in the second quarter, third quarter, and Anthony Edwards decides, "Yep, this is my night. I'm feeling it." He decides to start going to the rim. He shoots eleven free throws. And it's it's actually don't you think it's a little surprising that he has not had a fifty point because he's very capable of scoring fifty points. Yes, but he has yet yep. to really flex that muscle. Like if he if at any point the last two years he decided I'm scoring fifty points tonight, he could have had a fifty burger by now. It's almost a testament that he hasn't scored fifty points because he's make even like late in the game he's making the right pass to Nikhil in the corner when he's got forty nine points. Yep. So I just I mean the fact that he he decided enough is enough. I'm going to end this game, and uh, and he gets his first 50 point game of this of, of his career. Very impressive, very impressive. So, Chris Finch's post game quotes I, I thought were very telling on on that because he was obviously asked about the 50 point game, and instead of saying, "Oh yeah, that was fantastic," but he talked about the fact that the 50 points came within the flow of the yeah. actual game, which is which is enormous like that's unlike a, the charlotte game where everyone decided and exactly. i'm not just blaming cat like even anthony edwards right. didn't shoot basically for the first half because we're gonna get him 100 we're gonna right. get cat and they lost but but they lost complete sight of the fact that they are there in that case to play a game like right. last night they didn't now now you can debate you know should you really fall that far behind a wizards team that i think was missing four key players and even that's being used lightly because they're key, terrible key, key yeah players, key yeah. players to <laughs> them um but yeah i thought i i think slowly but surely because there's no question ant is a phenomenal talent okay but it's my opinion that over the course of the season slowly but surely and there's stops and starts here there's there's progression regression at times but we are seeing the maturation of a superstar 100 percent. like like you can see it and some nights it goes backwards but you can see it because there is no like you know greatness when you see it right like there have been a lot of good players really good players and at times those players can be dominant but you never look at them and say, that's greatness. You say, that's skill. You, look, that's impressive. It's skill, but it's not greatness. I feel like with Ant, there are times where it's like, no, this is greatness. This is what greatness looks like. Like, like when you are drawing league-wide comps to Jordan, that's not just because you had a good game. And so I really feel what we're seeing here is the evolution of a player into a superstar but you, but he came with the packaging, if that makes sense. The, and the pack to me, the packaging includes his size. Just let's just call this kind of a, 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 a last night was a tribute to what Anthony Edwards has become. That's I guess I'll give you I'll give you a handful of wolves observations here. I've got a bag of wolves ob- observations, and we'll start there. That just piggybacking off what you said. Observation number one: last night it wasn't necessarily about beating the Wizards or dropping fifty against the Wizards. I think last night was a tribute to who he has become as a player over four years. His size, the guy is a freight train. Just look at him next to a Jordan pool or even look at him next to like Mike Conley, just a, you know, a fairly normal sized NBA point guard. He is a freight train of muscle and athletic ability. And he can, he can barrel his way to the rim. And that's part of the problem is like, he doesn't get moved off of his spot with, with contact. That should be a foul. Yes, but he's also finding ways in the second half of the season on a night like last night. He's just, I, I need to get to the free throw line. I need to get to the rack and stop settling for jump shots. But also toward the end, when it's clear he's on pace for 50 points, he's got 42 points with like six or seven minutes to go. And the Wolves have now opened up an eight or a 10 point lead. And he's he's clearly hunting for the last eight points. But even within that, 
He's finding the open man in the corner for a three. Oh, here's Conley over here on the wing for an open three. His ability now to go get those seven, eight, nine assists when when his team needs it. And then the defense we've seen. So, man, like it feels like he is playing some of his best basketball. The three-point shot has come back after it was gone for a week. It's the it's the right time for this version of Ant to be to be peaking here. And he's a guy that's elevated in both of the last two years in the playoffs, where like the version you saw in the regular season two years ago yes. was upgraded in the playoffs. He, he he elevates and starts scoring 25, 26 a game. Last year, that Nugget series, he scored 32 points a game in five games against the, the uh, you know, later on, the, the champions of the league. They went on to win the title. So, I don't know. I just thought last night was, it was uh, like a, not a career achievement award or anything, but it was just this fully realized version of the first four years of Anthony Edwards. I also love the the fact that he comes off as a guy who can a take criticism, which some guys simply can't, and b thrive up off that. Case in point is post game comments and credit to Finch, man. Finch just put Finch pushes a lot of buttons really well, and. I loved the story Ant told that Finch basically called him in a couple of days ago and said, hey, we're playing Washington and Atlanta, okay? So you might not be too excited, but damn it, we need you to play like it's important. Mm -hmm. and, and, and what I love about Ant is he talks about that and basically says, I don't want to get called in for that, but he gets it, right? Like how many guys have, have we seen, Phil? How many guys in various sports have we covered who have challenged the same way? They almost are like exasperated by it. Well, I don't need to be told that. Or, mm -hmm. you know, why, why are you picking on me? Ant thrives off that. And, and I do think that greatness comes with uh, a certain a certain ability to take criticism and thrive. And the key guy is Jordan. I mean, Jordan was making things up. Jordan was actually making up being spurred by, by people to thrive. Mm -hmm. And my response is this. If that's what you got to do, then go ahead and do it because whatever draws your greatness out. Um, but, but I mean, I've had so much frustration with various guys I've covered who you could tell the potential is there. Now they're not ant good, but they're damn good. Right. But when they get challenged, they almost shrink. Yeah, they almost get the pissed opposite. off about that. He thrives off of that. And to mm -hmm. me, that is such a positive thing. Yep. And I don't know, I just, we'll see what happens in the playoffs, but there's been a lot of chatter around the national talking heads about how, well, there's the Gobert chatter that Gobert gets played off the court in the playoffs, and this is just yeah. a totally different roster. That Jazz team had absolute sieves on the perimeter. Yeah, Joe Ingles was one of your, like, wing defenders. Don't, you know, don't Donovan Mitchell, Jones. Donovan Mitchell couldn't guard a tree stump in the playoffs. Yeah. So, and now you get Jaden McDaniels, you get Kyle Anderson, you get Anthony Edwards. But the other thing that, is sort of a knock on the Timberwolves when you listen to the national talking heads is, do they have a guy that can really carry a playoff series? Well, Anthony Edwards was the best scorer not named Jokic in that series against Denver last year. And there were times where he was the best scorer, period, in a couple of those games, like just getting what he wanted when he wanted. So they absolutely do, to your point, have a guy, even though he's only 22 years old, that I think can carry them offensively for stretches when he needs to. Now it needs to be within the flow. And sometimes he gets a little heat checky in some yeah, of these games. Sure. So he's got to calm down with some of that. But um, yeah, that was, um, they needed that to, to drop that game last night would have been an epic disaster based on how the standings are. If your goal is the one seed and we'll talk more about kind of the last three games and the different paths, but observation number two, totally different subject here. This is now going into the, um, the pre and post game comments from Rudy Gobert and Chris Finch and the reports coming down today. Doogie's been all over this, but now you've got Shams and Woj talking about cat is going to play in the ring. He's not going to play against Denver tonight, but he is going to play most likely the last two games at home against the Hawks and the Suns. So observation number two, if you read between the lines, there is an unsure feeling about how cat is going to reintegrate back into this lineup. I think everyone is hopeful. They know what Cat can be when he's at his best. We've seen the unicorn version of Cat, but before I read some of these quotes, we've also seen the playoff version, the bad version pop up way too many times the last two years. The Memphis series, the Denver series. 
I mean, he has three or four games in those two series where he shoots 33% or worse. He just can't get the shots that he wants, can't make a shot. Um, he has committed five or six fouls in the majority of the games in the Memphis and the Denver series in which he's now he's like coming off the floor four minutes into the first quarter. Like we've seen in the six plus, so it's 11 playoff games, Memphis and Denver. He also, wasn't there a, a play in game that he, the Clippers play in game from a couple D'Angelo of years ago. Russell saved that game. Yeah. Yeah. Now cat had a great first half against the Lakers in a playing game. So like he, so Sure. He hasn't been terrible in all these games, but in about 40% of the playoff and playing games, he has been a detriment to the Wolves winning. It's a fact. Like anyone who's watched these games, there is a bad version of Cat that has shown up in the playoffs way too often. And so now that they've kind of found something here without him, and they were playing great with him too, right? Like they had, they were winning 68 to 70% of the games with him. But here are some quotes from the locker room last night. Dane Moore asked Chris Finch how seamless he feels it will be to reintegrate Cat into the lineup. And Finch said, quote, certainly not without its hiccups. I think that has more to do with the overall rotations and minutes and roles and just trying to figure that out. Obviously, he's extremely talented. We need him to be a very good version of himself. But I also think there are some things we've figured out in the last couple weeks that we're going to need him to kind of lean into as well. It might be slightly different than the rhythm in which we were playing before he left. Mm -hmm. Then Britt Robson followed up. What did you gain in the time that Cat was out? And how can you retain those gains when he comes back? And Finch said, quote, I think one thing we've gained, a lot of credit to Anthony Edwards because the pressure and the attention on him went up. And for the most part, I thought he did a really good job of getting off the ball, using his gravity to create offense for teammates. And now we have another person that draws that type of attention. And Kat's got to really lean into making the easy, quick play and not letting the ball get stuck. Yep. And then the, the last one here, and then I'll shut up and you can react. Dane Moore asked Rudy Gobert, what has to happen for Kat to reintegrate smoothly? And Gobert said, obviously, I think it's going to be Kat just, yeah, taking that challenge of doing the little things, whether it's defensively. I know his effort level is going to be there. <laughs> But offensively, yeah, just bringing his unique talent that we miss, that's going to be great for us. But spacing for his teammates, keep the offense flowing like it's been flowing. You add his talent to the offense, it can be pretty special. So it's like praise, hey, we love him. Yep, like we're excited to have him back. But the spacing's been really great, and the right. decision-making's been really quick, and right. we've, we've, we've kind of unlocked some things here in the last three, four weeks, and he needs to lean into those things. So, like, the tone of it is really interesting coming out of the locker room last night. Which is why it's absolutely imperative that, if, that he plays probably in, ideally, the last two games. Because, like, you don't want him – you don't want the first time he's back to be game one of the playoffs, and now the ball gets sticky – and it wasn't sticky, and now the spacing gets wonky, and it wasn't wonky. Um, is Cat capable of playing within the flow of how this team has played? Yes. And that's partially go going to be on coaching as well. But there there needs to be, like, like here's, here's the thing, I think. It's actually not that hard. Nas himself has a unique skill set, right? So I think what I think the nice thing that you have from an instructional film point of view is you can sit cat down with film of what Nas has done and say we need you as a starter to fill this role. So it's not like the Timberwolves didn't have a, a guy at all like Cat and now Cat's back and oh my god, we were playing a totally different style. It's that Nas is more, how can I say this, able to get into the flow easier of what he's being told. Where Cat, because partially because he's been a star his in, entire life, is more used to be things being built around him. And this isn't even, I'm not even ripping Cat. I'm, I'm just saying it's a fact that Cat, throughout most of his basketball life, has been the featured guy. And so teams, his teams adapt to what he does. Well, now it's more like, okay, you see what Nas did here? Because Nas is not a, a superstar, but he's turned himself into a really good player. So I think that's the advantage. But could it get wonky? Absolutely. I think um, the, the biggest question off that, like on the Nas comparison is, Nas is averaging like two or three more three-point attempts since, right. since, he, since Kat's been out. Right. Kat was, you know, Nas is averaging like two or three more three attempts per game, and he's making 45% of them. Yep. The Wolves need that. The Wolves need their great three-point shooters to get up more attempts. 
Right. And if it means standing in the corner and just sort of waiting for the action to come to you. But the Na- nice thing. Nas Reed's cool doing that. But the nice thing is that you you can show Cat that and say, this is exactly what we want. Like, like it's not, it's not as if Nas played a very different role. And now it's like, oh my God, how are we, how are we going to get Cat ba- back in? He's not going to understand it. Mm-hmm. Like what Nas was doing. And yes, and the threes. And by the way, as we've talked about, and I'll know Cat is a marvelous three point sh- shooter. So this isn't like a, a big ask. This is something he should do well. But, you know, when you start the playoffs, there's not room for, well, it took a couple of games, but now now it's going to work. Like, it's go time. They need the best, most bought-in version of Carl. They don't need the rogue, I'm going to dribble drive through traffic right. and fall to the ground. Yeah, and, do, and, and do my weird like thing to the basket. Get called for an offensive foul. Like That version of Cat needs to be minimized going into these playoffs. Yep. Because if you can if you can get rid of the the bad stuff that has tripped up this team and tripped him up in these playoff series, and you can accentuate the things that are great about Cat shooting mm-hmm. downhill as the role man on pick and roll, and some of the defensive stuff he's been doing great this year, like the size that he brings and the depth with now Nasri coming off the bench. Mm-hmm. If they can lean into all those positives, they can win the NBA championship. Correct. Crazy to say, but if you're if you're no, getting the can. best version of Cat and you get the depth of, you get Jaden McDaniels playing in the playoffs. He wasn't there last year, Nas Reed. But if he's going rogue and he's trying to do things that are not efficient and effective, sometimes he goes rogue on post ups. Sometimes he's sticky with the ball. Right, like right. It's not hating to say these things when you have the coach and Rudy well, Gobert saying we love this guy. He's one of the most talented players we've ever seen. We also need him to lean into the things that are working here. That's really telling, and it's going to be interesting to watch here end of the regular season going into the playoffs. And this is not just like a cat thing. Everybody has to stay within the concept of what they what the scheme is. Everybody, including Ant. But what we yep. don't get hero ball-y. In but what games. we've yeah. seen without cat is a window is a window to everybody for the most part for most games falling in line, right? Mm-hmm. So like this, this is not a pick on cat thing. This is not that at all. What this is, is look, you've seen the concepts that work. And and like, I think this is why Finch is so gray. I think this is why Finch at times sounds so tired because he's, he's the one it's not just with Carl. He's been trying to get this across. Hey, these things work and we've seen it now. And so it needs to stay like that. But, but I think where it's most important is we can't be having a conversation two games in to a first round series where it's been like, Whoa, th- this is going to take some time. You don't have time. The, the luxury of time is gone. And what you also have is, and this is where decisions can be made at times. If it doesn't work, if we do get guys going rogue, you've got a guy on your bench who, you know, won't go rogue in Nas. Yeah. That's the thing. Like it's, it kind of sucks that you, he has to play fewer minutes. But at the same time, you're welcoming back one of the most talented players in the NBA. Correct. Yeah. And you and you want that depth and you want those minutes. Um, and by the way, you said something a couple minutes ago, like it doesn't have to be a knocker. It doesn't have to be like pick on cat. Well, I will say this. His performances in the playoffs the last two years are worthy of picking on. When you are a super max player and you have been the number one overall pick and the face of a franchise, and you're capable of doing all these things on a basketball court, Mm. and you come up well short of what you're capable of individually and as a team, as one of the team leaders, right? You can pick on that. Like, it's okay to, it's okay to poke at that. I think people get really sensitive. Like you're poking a cat. You're damn right. Cause he hasn't played up to his expectations in the last two playoff uh, runs, quote unquote. They haven't really yep. been runs. They've been they've been bounced. Yeah. So it's time, man. Like you're not 22 years old anymore. You know you've been this. This will be your fourth playoff stretch. Let's find a way, man. I think it's perfectly acceptable to poke a little bit and say, hey, right. This franchise needs a little more than you've been giving them in the playoffs the last couple of years. But also, Ant needs Ant needs to continue to play like Ant's been playing. Like like Cat's return can't cause Ant to change. That that's the thing is you've got a few guys with the potential to go rogue. And my point is this, you don't have time. You don't have time for that. The luxury of time is gone. The playoffs are a grind. And, and as crazy as what you said 
sounds, this team has a chance to make a championship run, okay? So there's not time for like two games where you're sort of figuring it out and mm-hmm. now you win. And now what should have been a five game series goes seven. Cause you know what? Those are, those are games and minutes you don't need to play. So like everything, everything about, I think a championship run has to be like a fine tuned Ferrari. It can't be like a, well, we started jalopy and then we got going, but then we saw it slow down again, this whole thing. So yes, the max players need to 100% understand their role game one of the first round and if that yeah. can't change one last thing on this year on the cat ant front because there are some things that like yes anthony edwards get to the free throw line don't settle for just volume three point shooting you you can find other ways to get your points and to to get teammates going when you drive to the hoop there's open to, there's open players on the wing in the corner that are maybe wide open to keel alexander for three jay mcdaniels but on the playoff front Carl Anthony Towns in the regular season in his career averages 23 points a game in the playoffs. It's 18. I'm just going to use that one number. All right. His scoring goes from 23 to 18 in the playoffs. Okay. Anthony Edwards in the playoffs. So his, his regular season average is 23 points a game. Also his playoff average is 28. So one guy, so they both average 23 points a game in the regular season in their career. One guy goes down five points a game in the postseason, in part because of foul trouble, in part because of just not being able to get the shots that he wants or being impatient, maybe. Right. And the other guy elevates above his. And by the way, it's Anthony Edwards is doing it last year. He shot 48 percent from the field against the Nuggets. And that's it's not like he's doing it inefficiently. So. Small sample size, only two years. He's only 22 years old, but it's great that Anthony Edwards has a knack for elevating. Need to see a little bit more of that from Carl here. And this is great infrastructure for him to work with. It's the best team that he's ever been surrounded by. Dare I say this? This this playoff either run or disappointing ouster go, will go a long way towards deciding Carl's future here? Yeah, 100%. Because if it's kind of if it's another where let's say they play two series, they win in five or six games in the first round, and then they get bounced. Maybe they run into a a tough team with a couple Hall of Famers in the second round. Um, they check the playoff series win box for the first time in twenty years, and they get bounced in seven games. They play like twelve playoff games, and he no shows four of them, five of them, foul trouble, you know, inefficient offense, whatever it is. Mm-hmm. second apron luxury tax. It just, it makes it a lot easier for the wolves to say, you know what, what if we could get a couple pieces for this and maybe recoup some draft capital, get out right. of the second luxury tax apron. The draft capital might be, might be tempting as well. You're right on, on that. And, and you, you now also have a really, uh, a large look at what life was like without him. And from the quotes that you just read from Gobert and Finch, there was a lot to like. On the flip side, though, if he is playing at his peak capability and he's playing the defense that he's been playing all year, because, again, they built up this Western Conference one seed you know, run of three months or whatever it was with Carl fully integrated into this thing. If you get the best version of him and he doesn't know show like he has in the Memphis and the Denver series and the Houston series going back to the Jimmy Butler year, and he's just in it, and it's it's the best version of playoff cat that you've seen. Like I said earlier, you can win the championship. Yep. And I think you would happily pay luxury tax, whoever is the owner. <laughs> yep. You could happily pay luxury tax to keep the band together and keep a guy who's 28 years old in his prime in the mix here. So, you know, just I think it's to wrap this part of the conversation, it's just fair. It I think this. I don't know if skepticism is the right word for the tone, but it's very clear that Gobert and Finch were saying, love him, excited to have him back, really need him to focus in on leaning into the things that we're doing. That is a fair sentiment, and it's also a fair ask to say, need more out of Carl Anthony Towns in this year's playoffs than he has given the Wolves the last two. It's not hating. It's just, it's a fact. It's a absolutely. It's a viable ask. Yep. Um, couple other observations for you here, but a shout out to our friends at Modest Brewing, just a short walk away from Target Center. Modest Brewing is a great tap room in the North Loop 
couple blocks down the street from Target Center. Cans available in liquor stores throughout the metro area and a new event space. Perfect for parties that are either 40, 50, up to 120 people. Could be corporate parties, happy hours, birthday parties, wedding stuff. There's a private entrance, a private bar, a great view that overlooks the brewery, a fully tricked out AV setup. So if you're uh, looking for an event space, hit our friends up at Modest Brewing, modestbrewing.com, and maybe stop in for one of these last two home games coming up uh, to end the regular season and for the playoffs for a little pregame action before you go to Target Center. And a shout out to our friends at First Equity Mortgage, Minnesota-based, 24 years in the market. About seven years ago, I had a great experience refinancing my home at the time with David over at First Equity. He's been a 20-year Wolves and Link season ticket holder, uh, and uh, he's one of the best in the business, as is First Equity. They work fast. They have a great reputation in the community, and uh, they also offer programs for veterans and for new home buyers. So if you're in the market, Talk to our friends at First Equity. Go to femort.com. That's femort.com or scornorth.com. Keyword David. So, okay. Another observation for you here, Judd. Mm -hmm. The team chemistry has come a long way from one year ago yesterday. Because yesterday was the one-year anniversary of the punch. Rudy Gobert punching Kyle Anderson, getting suspended by the team. And now you watch those guys, even from the beginning of the season, they're chumming it up. They have great chemistry. They clearly love being around each other. Uh, they're two of the team leaders. But would you have thought one year ago, as Gobert is ending this sort of subpar, tumultuous season, oh, yeah. punching one of his teammates, that we'd be sitting here with three games left in the regular season, a chance to be the number one seed in the Western Conference, a chance to get to 57 or 58 wins, and everybody loves each other. You know, it's kind of amazing how far they've come chemistry-wise in one year. Yeah, if you had, uh, after that game, if you had asked me that question, I would say no. I, I'd say it's the Wolves. Of course not. Um, but, you know, in some ways, that was as as harsh as, as that seemed. And it got Gobert suspended for the uh, playing game against the Lakers. Uh, as detrimental as that seemed at, at the time, I guess in retrospect, it could have gone one of two ways, right? Yeah. Which is it could have blown things up and now Gobert is still a disaster, which clearly did not take place. Or it could do what it seems to, to have done, which is galvanize things. And I, I think what's important is it didn't take place between like a hothead player. Like it, it, it wasn't a, oh my God, there goes player X again, right? He's punching a teammate. Like a, this like is, a dream on or something. Yeah. Or... This is the crap he does. He can't be controlled. He has to be traded. It happened between, Gobert, who was clearly and justifiably frustrated by a bad year, partially yeah. his fault, by the way, but also Kyle. And, and like, this is the ethos of Kyle, slow-mo, right? Like, like when he's not playing well, which he was not, and we're all like, do you really want him on the roster? And the Wolves were adamant. Oh, yeah, yeah, he's our guy. This is sort of why. Like, but the fact it happened between those two guys, I think now in retrospect was incredibly important. Because it wasn't just a, it wasn't a flare up as as you said of like a Draymond Green, it was a frustration, but it was also I think in some ways now in retrospect galvanizing. By comparison, Jaden McDaniel's punching a wall does you no good. Like a year after, I still can't look back and say you know what was really smart when Jaden thought he was punching a curtain and broke his hand. Mm -hmm. It's just a detrimental, stupid thing. I think the punch in retrospect was actually a growth point for this yeah, team oddly to enough, evolve yeah. and grow. And so if if I may say now, I think that there was actually a lot of positive, if nothing else, because those two guys who in their own ways are very important to th this team, Gobert as much or more on the floor, Kyle off of it, but those two guys showed a passion that this damn team has lacked for far too long. Yeah, and, and it's so interesting how they kind of navigated through it. And, I mean, hell, we spent weeks and weeks in the offseason talking about how there's no way you can just bring the band back, right? I mean, they're punching each other and underachieving. The The underlying metrics show that it was really hard to justify these three big guys. Like, there was even questions about, can you really bring Nas Reed back? He's great, but can you bring him back if you're also going to have Rudy and Cat? Because statistically, you could not play Nas Reed with Rudy Gobert. It was like right. a minus 10 points per 100 possessions. Yeah. 
but credit to it's a lot of a lot of guys doing individual work, both sort of, you know, basketball related and maybe even mentally to figure this thing out. The fact that from a chemistry standpoint, everything got squashed. And then just from an on court pairing standpoint, you can now play Nas Reed with Rudy and you can play cat with Rudy at a high level and you can wind up having net positive uh, plus minuses over the course of long stretches. So yeah, it's, I don't know, man, like a year ago, I would have said no way are you going to be winning 58 games with this exact same roster essentially. But one of the biggest things too, is they were only like a month and a half into the Mike Conley era of leadership. Yep. I think there was a lot of dissonance with D'Angelo Russell and Rudy Gobert. And it just, the vibes felt weird for the first few months of the year. Yes. And Conley was still pretty fresh. And so now you've had like a year and two months of Mike Conley's steady hand and guidance. And that's been a huge factor, I think, in validating Rudy Gobert to the rest of his teammates saying, no, like this dude's a stud. Let's let's not clown him like D'Angelo Russell was. Let's find a way to play with him. And now you see like last night, dude, Anthony Edwards is dropping pocket passes well, in the yeah. lane to Gobert for dunks. And yeah. it's crazy. I I don't know that, that this could be 100% proven, but it also, and this is where Conley's just a genius, it also feels to me like Conley has allowed himself to slip more and more in the background as the season has progressed, and it's become more of an ant as the captain, which is what a great captain can do. A great captain can empower, like like because Conley knows where, where this is going, which mm -hmm. is why he, he took, you know, a lesser contract to stick around. But it feels like we were really focused on Conley for like the first two or three months. Mm -hmm. And we don't talk about him nearly as much. And he has struggled at times. He's old. But more importantly, I think what he's done is purposely and very carefully, meticulously pass the torch. So like credit to him too, because, you know, th this is a league of egos, eccentric people. And it feels, it really feels like Conley has, in his own subtle way, shifted things. It's impressive. It's well, really he, impressive. But he's always just kind of there. You see, you, you see, you look over at the bench if you're in the arena, or you see on TV, and he's just like sitting next to Ant with his, yep. with his arm around him, or he's like he's explaining something to him. It happened probably four or five different times last night between plays or during a timeout. That dude's a coach, if if he wants. Agreed. That dude's a head coach. Yeah, he could be, think about what, like, Teron Liu has been as a coach. You know, there's been a lot, like, like Jason Kidd got, a lot of point guards are the first ones yeah. that that get elevated not long after they're done playing. I'm, I'm with you. If, if he wants to coach in a couple of years, I think he's going to play for at least two more years. If he wants to coach after that, it won't, it won't be long after he retires that he might get a shot. Yep. And then my last observation for you here is uh, just that the number one seed is on the line tonight in Denver. And that's crazy. And we just kind of talked about how far we've come in the last 12 months with the team chemistry. But if they beat Denver tonight, they don't clinch it. But I want to go through the scenarios here. So Denver tonight, you're tied with Denver right now in the Western Conference standings. And, and both Denver and the Wolves are a game up on the Thunder. Now, the first tiebreaker is head-to-head. -head. So if you beat Denver, you'll be three and one against them on the season. So there'll be a game behind you with two games to go, and you'll have the you'd have to literally if you beat them, you'd have to lose two, and they'd have to win two for them to jump you. Now Denver's schedule is really easy because it's two road games where they get San Antonio and Memphis. Now San Antonio has been a lot feistier lately, and Victor Wembanyama has been doing some ridiculous things. But if Denver needs that game, they're going to get that game. Sure. So you can. If you beat Denver tonight with the tiebreaker in hand, you'd have to lose two. They'd have to win two to jump you again. Now, if you lose, then you're going to need some help because you're going to need them to lose to either San Antonio or Memphis. But then there's Oklahoma City lurking a game back. Yep. And the season series is split between the Wolves and the Thunder, two games apiece. Mm -hmm. Then there's the division tiebreaker. But then there's like th potential three-way tiebreakers That's if Denver is also in the mix. That's where football gets super confusing. Yeah, so it gets complicated. Now, right now, the Wolves are uh, a game up in the loss column with the division record. If it's a head-to-head -head tiebreaker, let's say the Wolves beat Denver and then Oklahoma City beat San Antonio tonight. And so now it's Oklahoma City is a game back of the Wolves. 
Well, the division record tiebreaker comes next, and the Wolves are a game up in the division record tiebreaker uh, bracket, and they would then have they would then have beat Denver for another division win. So, basically, if you beat Denver tonight, and you can even win one of those home games this weekend, you're in good shape. You got the one seed, I think, by my math. And the Suns are are the last game on Sunday, right? Yeah, and they're going to be. That's the thing, like. It'd be, I'm trying to think of a scenario where the Wolves wouldn't have to play for anything. I mean, you want to you want to play cat and see what that looks like. Absolutely. Um, but there is a chance that you will absolutely be playing for something and that that game might determine whether you play the Suns or not in the first round. Right. Because everything is so jumbled right now. The 4-5 matchup is pretty solidified. It looks like it's going to be Clippers and Mavericks in that 4-5 game. But then you got the Pelicans, who are a game up on the Suns, who are seven, and then they're a game up on the Kings, who are eight. The Lakers are the Lakers are pretty much they can't. There's almost no way they can get to the six right now. So, um, man, buckle up, man. But resting like, guys is is does not appear in at least the Wolves, Nuggets, and Thunder's cases to be an option, right? No, not at all right now. Like, no. you're not going to be like, well, we can get this, you know, let's get Ant some rest before the, the playoffs start. The only way it would be a thing is, and by the way, Oklahoma City has not been playing their best recently. They've had, like, I think they've they've sat Jay's some starters, right? too. Yeah. So if you beat the Nuggets tonight and then you beat the Hawks mm-hmm. on Friday, mm-hmm. I'm pretty sure that clinches the one seed. And it makes it even more clinchy if Oklahoma City like loses a but game to to your point. You want San Cat to play, like if Cat's going to play in those last two games, you you want him to be playing yeah. with starters. Like it's interesting. Yep, that's the thing. Like if there's nothing to play for, which would be a great problem to have, do you play for just like flow in chemistry? Well, I don't know. which I would say ahead. absolutely not. Beat the not. Nuggets first. Beat the if Nuggets. Cat wasn't yeah. coming back. It's my, <laughs> my God. It's 82 games of. Intensity. Yeah. Beat the Nuggets first, and then we can figure out what happens this weekend. So, all right. I know you got to record a Judd's hockey show and put the wild season to bed. They just were mathematically eliminated last night. A lot to talk about. A lot to talk about. So people can check that out. And then Purple Daily, we gave you some write that down predictions and also a Mel Mel Kuyper, easy for me to say, 4.0 with trades, a two-round Mel Kuyper. Mm -hmm. So thanks for hanging out with us here. It's Flagrant Howls, a Timberwolves lifestyle podcast.